<laughs> this is an illegal vote, okay? It's against the Spanish Constitution, which was written in the, in the most... Uh, should we continue? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so folks, if we can just kind of scoot this side a bit, that's all right. Uh, above, well... Yeah, if we split back just a tiny bit more, just be careful on the curve there, we can see. Yeah, perfect. So as we're looking up above the Bank of Spain, you can see two recognizable flags. The flag we can't see, that's covered by the trees, is the EU flag, okay, the 12 stars of the first EU. Believe it or not, uh, despite political turmoil, Spain and Catalonia are relatively pro-EU, right? There's no extreme right-wing groups here because of the recent fascist history when Francisco Franco only died in 1975. That's not that long ago. So, almost even more dramatic in the, in the rain, actually. This, my friends, is what is called Via Sepulcral Romana. That's fancy Latin, of course, for Roman graves. Inter a lot of interesting things going on here. Firstly, uh, like I said, it was an accidental discovery. Most of these are actually tombs, right? They're called coupe. A tomb would be, like, it's not a headstone. The body would have been interred in there. None of these have been broken open to have a, a look at, you know, what's left of bodies. I suspect that the pagan Romans had some ideas about um, embalming or even mummification, right? Because remember, they did conquer Egypt for a while, and Egypt's are the masters of mummification. This is called a baixada. That's a Catalan word meaning an incline. Um, and it comes from the verb baixar, it means to go down. Um, and the Spanish verb bajar is pretty similar, of course. Um, but a baixada here is known to be a site where a young girl called Ulalia, when she was only 13 years of age, was put in a barrel of knives, shards of glass, and rolled down the hill several times. Why on earth for? What on earth for? Mm. Because she had been a heretic, labeled a heretic. A 13-year-old Catalan, who was actually originally from Tabagona in the south, that defied the Roman pagans by saying and stating her Christianity. Even her parents had kind of reneged and everyone else saying, look, we'll just have to accept paganism for now anyway because they're going to do some very horrific things to us. Which, as we know, they did to several others across the Christian world at the time. But she stood firm and she said no. There's a story that Dacian, Dacian is the name of the regional Roman commander, if you will, took the young girl out to something called the Tomb of Venus, uh, a Roman goddess, and said to her, just kiss the Tomb of Venus and we will accept that you are now recanting your heretical beliefs. Not only did she not kiss the tomb, but apparently she kicked it so hard it split in two. Now, my issue with that is that the tomb of Venus apparently weighed about two and a half tons. <laughs> so, come on, how could a, a young girl, like, she must have had some pies, man. <laughs> right? yeah, yeah. Some power. She should have been a soccer player. his hand down on the wound, trying to stem the bleeding, and then get somebody to stitch this guy up or, you know, using his natural hair. <laughs> but then he turns around, and that shield that Wilfred has is actually yellow. So he takes the yellow shield, and he looks down at his foes, and he takes the four fingers of his, you know, of his hand, and drags an image across the shield of four red stripes. Voila! Thusly creating Catalan flag. So, again, is that a true story or not? I don't think so. Why does it exist if not? Uh, but those are the two protagonists, as I said. The guest leave, right? And as he is uh, talking to the wife later as they leave, she lays into him, calling him a slob and saying it was disgusting. And he's still guzzling wine as this is going on. And she's like, you stay here tonight. I'm furious with you. I don't want you coming upstairs. And he's like, fine. So then, of course, he's sitting alone in this perfect state of contentment. Then he may call in his jester, right? A royal appointed entertainer. That is almost like an improv actor that has to come over and then, you know, perform something. Maybe a song or a piece of music or a poetry recital or some jokes, whatever is at the whim of his majesty. Now, Bore came from a long line of jesters. His father had just given up the job lately and handed it down to his son. So he's under a bit of pressure because the king says to him, he says, I want you to tell me jokes. And your dad was an incredibly good joke teller. So go. Oof, a bit of pressure already. 
So he's like, okay. And he fires off some one-liners. And they're not going too well, because the king is still like, mm -hmm, yeah, okay. And then still goes his, jump, his, his wine. Then he comes up with an anecdote. Now, this had been previously dictated. It was found later in his journal. That's what we know and why we know uh, what the story was. But imagine this guy. Okay, so first of all, Catalonia, as we saw on the map already, is like about a, you know, this size. It's almost roughly triangle, Barcelona here. This guy's from the north. Uh, I like to think of this in an English-speaking context would be set in Britain. It's still a royal country. Um, and you've got the monarchy in London. This guy would be from the north, from Scotland somewhere. Uh, forgive me with anyone's Scottish friends, I'm going to do a soft, <laughs> but hopefully decisive Scottish dialect to reflect this guy's uh, conundrum. So he starts off with a joke. It's like, Hey, I'll tell you what, Your Majesty, you'll like this one, right? I was doing in the courtyard all day. Nay, I saw a deer, and that deer had been eating from the fig tree. That's no lewd. It's no lewd. I know that, right? It's no lewd. So I said, to my friends, I said, look at that deer, he's been eating figs. You're not allowed to do that. So what do we do? We went down to that deer. We grabbed him, all four of us, your majesty. We lifted him up. We marched him down to the fig tree. We turned him around, and then we made that run up there, grabbed his tail, tied it tightly. See the branch? And as he's dangling there, we don't just leave it at that. No, we don't. Thank you for your laughter, folks. But that's a, that wasn't the anticipated response. It's a weird story about animal abuse, right? right? I was wondering, how on earth is that funny? But look, the story's not over because the, the, the king laughed so hard, he had a massive. He's like, <laughs> oh, it's too much. <laughs> oh, I can't stop. Oh, it's, oh, boom. Falls onto the table, falls down to the ground, and it turns out he's just had a huge heart attack. His eyes are open, glazed over. He is dead as brown bread, folks. Yeah. Oh my god. The, the jester's like, Oh, I've overachieved. <laughs> Bugger. I better get out of here, right? Yeah. So he tries to run. But of course, he gets some pretty far. But it being a fortified compound, as he's kind of legging it out the gate, guards catch him. Where are you going? Oh, I just wanted a midnight run. It's like, no, wait a minute. Then somebody yells, His Majesty is dead. They're like, Ah, oh, you did it. Let's get back in here. And they're looking for signs, you know. Look, everything looks fine. So they say, You poisoned him, didn't you? No, I just told him a joke. And I did. That's all I did. So, yeah, right. Get in there. He was hung by the neck the next morning mm. for regicide. Mm. Poor guy, huh? Mm. Um, I would say a number of things there, but principally, don't tell that story to your kids. <laughs> yeah. It might encourage mediocrity in life. Yeah. <laughs> this guy just wanted to keep his job. He did so well, he got killed. Yeah. <laughs> Let's not think of it in those fashion, okay? Just a weird story about an unfortunate guy that paid the price for being too good, I yeah. suppose.